All right, I'm a little late to the party on this one, the X670 E Creator Wi-Fi. This is pretty much the board to get if you're into Linux and Linux support. Well, this is the board to get from Asus, certainly, for Linux and everything else. There's really only about two or three boards that really have excellent top-notch support for Linux and stuff that you might want to do, like VFIO and GPU pass-through and peripherals. This one also has built-in 10 gigabit Ethernet and some other features. It is definitely not the least expensive, but finally, I'm going to take a look. Now, I'd reached out to Asus a long time ago, and they said, yes, we will send you one of these, because I'd requested it. And it's weird. It was really weird. So, to make a long story short, They sent this instead, PA602 case, and the ProArt LC420 liquid cooler, which doesn't make any sense for an AM5 cooler. Okay, yeah, it does if you want it to run quiet. This is gonna be a lot of fun. And the ROG Strix Z790 Extreme Gaming Wi-Fi, or E-Gaming Wi-Fi. Well, I'm gonna review this board separately, don't worry. But if this grows up into this, I am here for our ProArt future. One of the things that the folks on our forum have been most excited about is the direction for pro art. I mean, yes, it does have RGB. RGB is a component here, but you can definitely tell that Asus, the marketing has clued into, hey, buyers of our products are more interested in this higher end stuff. And, you know, with things being what they are in terms of high end desktop, things are a little different than they were five or six years ago. High end desktop is much more expensive proportionally than it was. And a lot of the time, a 16 core CPU is really all you need at the high end. And this is pretty much the perfect board for a 16 core CPU. In fact, this board is so expensive, I really wouldn't recommend that you put anything in this other than a 16 core CPU. Yeah, so this board came from Newegg. I ordered this board from Newegg, which I probably should have done to begin with. This video would have been done a lot sooner. I just didn't want to end up with two, and then I never sell these. We always hang on to these forever and all time just to have as a reference just for testing. You never know when some rando is gonna show up and be like, BIOS version whatever broke my IOMMU groups. And then it's like, okay, I gotta get it out of the closet and take a look. It's fine, level one forums, it's what we do. Now Asus, to their credit, have put a lot of engineering into this board. This is a very crowded rear IO that includes onboard 10 gigabit ethernet. We've also got onboard two and a half gig. We've got a three USB-C ports, but the USB-C ports are all different. Two of them are DisplayPort passed through to your AM5 CPU. The other one is 20 gigabit. And then we've got all kinds of 10 gigabit type A ports. You've also got DisplayPort in and HDMI out. Wait a minute, DisplayPort in? Yeah, don't try to use the DisplayPort here for DisplayPort out. This is actually from the GPU. This is something really interesting that Asus has done with their PCIe tunneling uh, Thunderbolt compatible interface. Thunderbolt, yeah, if you have Thunderbolt peripherals, you can plug it into this motherboard. We can't really directly call it Thunderbolt, but if you have an add-in GPU and you want the, <laughs> the Thunderbolt-like ports to work, you need to feed the display from your display device out into the motherboard. Most motherboards take the cheap route and they use the iGPU off of your CPU to do that. But this board actually gives you the option. So you can run that to the display port in here and that can come from a discrete GPU, which is a really awesome niche feature. You don't know you need it until you need it and then you pull your hair out trying to find something that supports that. So this is a really big deal. Now the really amazing thing about this board is that it has lots of PCIe Gen 5 support. You've got M.2 Gen 5 support as well as two fully Gen 5 expansion slots plus an X4 slot on the bottom that comes from your chipset. So if you're rocking two full-size GPUs that you want to do VFIO or, or GPU pass-through, you can do that, but don't forget you've also got onboard video. So you could do onboard video for the host and you know, another GPU for your guest. Maybe you're gonna rock an older NVIDIA card and you're gonna use vGPU unlock and then be able to use multiple operating systems on a single GPU on those older NVIDIA cards, which is kind of an off-label, not really supported use, but something you can do. We've got four SATA ports on board. We've got one 30-pin front panel connection. We've got three USB 2.0 headers. So this motherboard has a ton of USB 2.0 connectivity. We have dual 8-pin power for the CPU as well as an extra 12-pin interface here next to the motherboard power. This 12-pin interface is a, a detail that a lot of motherboards miss in that your GPU can draw 75 watts from the motherboard. 
other than the CPU connections, which are supposed to be dedicated to the CPU. That's not always the case in all motherboard design, but most of the time that's true. You need 12 volts to be able to supply the GPU and all the other peripherals. Well, a GPU pulling 75 watts, one yellow cable in your power supply connector is only good for 75 watts, and this 24 pin connector has like one or two. And so you're really at the limits if you've got two power hungry GPUs in this platform to make things a little more stable. Asus adds an extra 12 volt connector here, and this is absolutely required on higher end motherboards like Threadripper and Xeon Workstation. You'll see this exact same kind of thing because the motherboard connector just doesn't supply enough 12 volts for the entire rest of the motherboard. Sometimes you do see, you know, one socket where 400 watts goes to the CPU and another one goes for the rest of the board. I think that would have been okay here because AM5 doesn't touch anywhere near 400 watts. Whereas something that uh, needs a little bit more wattage, you probably would have to use both 8-pin connections for the CPU power stage delivery. I kind of get it, but you know. The manual and everything else says that it doesn't do unbuffered error correcting dims, but as we'll see in the Linux testing, it does report that it's doing ECC and I can inject errors, which is surprising, but difficult to verify that that is actually functioning. We, we got ourselves into a little bit of trouble in AM4 where ECC was working, but it wouldn't necessarily report the errors in all circumstances. AM5 seems like a slightly worse situation, but we are actually able to inject errors. Like the functionality for injecting errors is exposed on the platform, so that's nice. Man, this case from Asus, it, it might deserve its own review. It's got a lot of little features that I like. Eight slots at the rear. Eight slots at the rear mean that you can have a GPU that hangs off the end of your motherboard. Doesn't really make sense for our X670E Pro Art, but if you're running a TRX50 motherboard, yeah, that could make a lot of sense. Now for the cooler. <laughs> the Pro Art LC420, we're gonna put it in the top because we've got the giant fans in the front on our Pro Art case. But this is also one of the few AIOs, the only AIO that I know of, that's bundled with Noctua NFA14 Industrial up to 2000 RPM fans. But again, AM5 doesn't run that hot. This is extreme maximum overkill for AM5. This would be more ideally suited to Z790. So what's the advantage of running AM5 with this, with our 16 core 7950X? Near silence. Near silence is the advantage. This cooler does have CPU socket support for 11.5X, 1200, 1700, AMD, AM4, and AM5. Doesn't support SP3. It's Threadripper, basically. A couple of screws pop out the top. You get this nice metal bracket that you can work with. It's just made for the couple of screws to hold it in, and this is what makes it easy to work with. You put your radiator on the top and your fans on the bottom, and it just slides into place. Now, in case you're wondering, your overall build experience, keeping ProArt with ProArt, really amazing. The 420 millimeter fan fits perfectly. There's channels for the cables. There's really, you know, Asus really has paid a lot of attention to all the little details. One of the really annoying things is the AM5 mounting system, though. You gotta put in four standoffs, four screws, four more standoffs, and then two thumb screws. So they really use a lot of extra mounting screws for AM5 versus LGA1700. So taking the other side off, we can see that Asus has really given us a lot to work with. We've got a bunch of three and a half inch drive bays, tons of room for expansion. We've got tons of two and a half inch drive bays, some drive mounts here as well and here. So flexibility, cable mounts, integrated fan hub. This is also your infrared controller and your dust filter notifier to notify you when you need to clean your dust filter, which is a pretty cool feature. And plenty of room here to route your cables, even if you're using a giant motherboard. One place I think Asus messed up is the power supply. Like you can't, you can't get it in that way. And you can't slide it in the back because there's no removable frame. You gotta take a bunch of screws out to take the bracket out to put it in from the other side. Uh, other case vendors have already figured this out. Asus should have just used them as a reference. I know that's like a faux pas, but come on. One thing the Asus manual doesn't mention is the smart filter button. There's a smart filter? Yeah, so there's some hidden buttons at the top here. You press those and that'll cause the front to release. But the front actually has these little infrared LEDs and it's looking to see if there's dust in your filter. And if there is dust in your filter, it's gonna complain. Of course, if you find yourself reaching for the maximum fan speed button, that may be a sign that you're doing it wrong and should clean your dust filters because obviously. 
A cool little feature of this case also is a power lock button. So Krista's cat Cricket is always turning off her computer. Not gonna be able to do that with that mechanical lock switch. There's like five of you that just were like, all right, here's my credit card. Well, it does feel like a premium case experience. So I'm actually very impressed with this case. I might actually do some more builds with this case. It is a premium price point, but it does feel premium, except for the whole power supply thing. Asus could have done a better job there. But overall, very quiet. Well, you know, if it's gonna be like super quiet, maybe also some noise dampening on the panels, but it is still shockingly quiet, even without the noise dampening material. And I like that it has wheels, and I like that it's just ready to go for office casters. So Asus gets all the points for clever engineering and thinking and everything else for this build. But let's get back to the motherboard. Our BIOS here is a little out of date, out of the box, no problem. Something you should get used to when you're doing a build like this is updating your BIOS. It's very straightforward on ASUS boards. If for some reason your board doesn't post, you can use ASUS BIOS flashback to flash the latest BIOS to your board and chances are it will post after you do that. Uh, of course, that's assuming that you've checked the other common things like you got all the power connections in and the motherboard diagnostic LEDs are telling you something useful, etc., etc. If all else fails, update your BIOS because that's probably it. Now in terms of Linux device support, everything on this motherboard support top notch. This is an absolutely top shelf Linux experience with this motherboard. Cannot be understated. Two and a half gig, 10 gig, wireless, uh, the onboard audio, Realtek ALC 1220. I mean, it's all very, very well supported. IOMMU grouping. Yeah, you do have two slots, X8, PCIe Gen 5, all the way back to the CPU, plus an M uh, PCIe Gen 5 uh, through the CPU. And so you can actually break that down into even more uh, slot configurations. Like you can do more bifurcation in the BIOS if you want to, to have like an X8, X4, X4 configuration. But I don't know that I really recommend that. Like if you're gonna go that nuts with PCIe peripherals, you probably wanna trade up to TRX50 or something that has a little bit more native PCI Express connectivity. I've got the Asus Tough Gaming 480 that we've reviewed previously, which would pair pretty well with this build, but since this is going to be a Linux build, I'm going to have to go with an AMD GPU. The AMD 7900 GRE or 7800 XT, those are leading right now for price versus performance, and so that's what I'm going to use in this build. And in terms of VFIO breakdown, yeah, it works great with this motherboard. If you want to run two AMD GPUs plus your onboard GPU, you're going to be able to do that hosting from a relatively modern kernel version 6.2 or greater Pop! OS or Ubuntu. So yeah, I'm, I mean... This motherboard is darned impressive from Asus. And I wish I'd gotten a chance to take a look at it sooner, but that's okay. I'm gonna take a look at it now because fun, exciting times. I'm Wendell, this is level one. It's been a quick look at the ProArt X670. And if you're thinking, should I, should I get the X670E? Only if you need 10 gigabit. If you don't need 10 gigabit, then you don't need this board. That's most of the cost of this board. Get the B650 version instead. You'll save a bunch of money. You, yeah, you don't have as many ports and some other features. But most of what you're paying for is the premium uh, of the ASUS name, for whatever that's worth, and also 10 gigabit ethernet, onboard 10 gigabit ethernet. You save a slot that way, which is pretty cool. I'm one of those level one, I'm signing out, and you can find me at the level one forums.